The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development Goal that includes 17 sustainable development goals were adopted by the United Nations in 2015 as a universal call to action to end poverty, protect the planet and ensure that by 2030, all people enjoy peace and prosperity. With the continued COVID-19 pandemic affecting every country, this session will look at how our efforts to end poverty, hunger, AIDS and discrimination against women and girls affected uh, has affected. What creativity, know-how, technology, financial resources and corporations are being applied to keep the sustainable development goals on track? A panel of experts will share their examples and provide insights into the state of the sustainable development goals globally and in Australia. This panel will be moderated by Lionel Lee, the partner at Invest United. Lionel Lee is a partner with the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees um, and the United Nations of High Commissioner for Refugees leads and coordinate international action to protect refugees and to resolve the refugees problems worldwide. I'd like to introduce Lionel now, who will be uh, coordinating and moderating the panel for this session. Thank you very much, Lionel. Thank you, Susanna. Uh, and thanks to the panel members um, for joining us this morning. Um, looking forward to an engaging session from uh, our team of experts. Um, and uh, I think it's, it's uh, a challenge trying to get people together from different parts of the world. It's, it's fantastic that we're able to do so. Thank you everyone for making time out of your schedule, whether evening for you, wherever you are. Um, and um, it's, it's fantastic that um, we have, uh, again, a diversity of uh, experts um, who are uh, also you know, specialists in different areas of um, the uh, sustainability development goals to share with us uh, today. So I guess without further ado, let me introduce uh, the first of our panel speakers, uh, who is based in uh, Melbourne, Australia, um, Kylie Porter. She is dedicated to improving sustainability practices for businesses of all sizes and across all sectors within Australia. Uh, Kylie, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Lionel Lee, and lovely to see you all today at the conference. So first of all, I wanted to acknowledge country. So in Australia, um, and obviously it's Australian audience, but there are very many international representatives here. We do what's called acknowledgement of country. So for me, the country that I'm talking to you from today, Rwandari country, which is part of the Kulin Nation, which as Lionel kindly said, is in Melbourne, Victoria. So I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and future. I thought that I'd start today with giving you an overview about what the Global Compact Network Australia is. We are the Australian local network of the United Nations Global Compact, which is the world's largest corporate sustainability initiative. It was formed about 21 years ago when in 1999 the, at the World Economic Forum, Kofi Annan, who was the then UN Secretary General, proposed that business leaders and the United Nations form a global compact of shared values and principles to bring a human face to the global market. Today, we call on all companies to align their strategy and their operations with our 10 principles on human rights, labor, environment, and anti-corruption, and also ask them to take it at actions that advance the societal goals. So this is where the UN Sustainable Development Goals come in. Globally, we have over 13,000 participants, um, and of that, they're all businesses. We also engage with around 3,800 non-business members, and there are now 71 local networks like Australia across the globe. In total, we service over 160 countries. In Australia, we have just under 200 members, and most of those are businesses, but we also work quite closely with the academic sector and the not-for-profit sector, including universities like Melbourne University and RMIT, which are hosting today's conference. The development of the United Nations Global Compact was at the time very innovative. It put the need to, for responsible business practices in the, heart, in the spotlight, asked for a quicker transition to a sustainable future. The 10 principles also encouraged businesses to take a long-term view on intractable issues and encouraged the development of technologies and processes to set the stage for long-term success. 
However, it was the adoption of the 2030 Agenda, including the SDGs, by all member states of the UN in 2015, that really ignited the need for an innovative economy and for the changes that are needed to improve our world. As many of you would be aware, meeting and realising the SDGs by 2030 will require unprecedented efforts and collaboration by all sectors of society. And the private sector plays a crucial role in forging this path. To achieve the goals and reap their benefits, the private sector needs to allocate and invest in innovative solutions, solutions that can tackle urgent social and environmental issues. And this also requires businesses to really realign their strategies and their operations to support human well-being, social equity, and action on climate change, some of the areas that are fundamental to the SDGs. It means turning risks into opportunities, identifying what parts of their businesses are exposed to environmental and social risks, and investing in areas that mitigate these risks, as well as looking at the investments that can be made into untapped opportunities. In doing so, businesses will pave the way for a stable, resilient and inclusive economy. But how do we know that business is really taking action towards the SDGs? In 2020, the UN Global Compact released its progress report, and this demonstrated that 84% of those participating in the report are taking specific actions that are aligned to supporting the SDGs. And of these, 61% developed products or services that actually contribute directly to the SDGs. However, despite this, there's only 46% of companies who were surveyed that are actually embedding the SDGs into their core business practices. And only 37% are designing business models that enable real contribution and impact on the SDGs. It's widely accepted, and I'm sure you'll hear lots about this at the conference, that the scale and pace of change to deliver the SDGs has not been enough or fast enough to date. At this point in time, with effectively eight years to go, the world is not on track to reach the 2030 agenda. We need to really speed up in this decade of action to reverse this predicament. This means implementing operating environments that incentivize SDG action one that shares or reduces risks and the investment needed to deliver fundamental sustainable change. We also need clear metrics that measure company contribution to individual SDGs at a global and sectorial level. Importantly, however, we need partnerships. We need industry and research cooperation. We need, res we need academia and civil society cooperation, and we need cooperation between those multilaterals and businesses too. And this is the only way that we're going to overcome the gap between sector level ambition and the step change needed to meet the SDGs. We know that businesses are using the SDGs and the Paris Agreement to guide their find and find their own way towards innovative solutions. They're making investments and they're forging in multi-stakeholder partnerships or a combination of both. The Business Commission for Sustainable Development or BCSD estimated that the SDGs drive about US $12 trillion worth of opportunities in cities, energy, food, agriculture, health and wellbeing. However, to harness this opportunity and drive progress at scale, more, and more investment needs to be unlocked. And to do this, we will need partnerships ones that mobilise shared knowledge, expertise, technology and financial resources. If done well, these partnerships will forge the path for inclusive and transformational growth. We'll also need collaboration to respond to the compounding and consecutive shocks of the past few years. The COVID-19 pandemic, economic decline, heightened weather impacts due to climate change, the speed of technological change and opaque supply chains, just to name a few. All sectors will need to undergo drastic transformations, embrace emerging economic opportunities and deeply embed the principles of sustainability. From a business lens, this requires us to transform and reconsider what business as usual means and reposition business as being more responsible and sustainably savvy. In creating partnerships and ensuring that their impact is measurable, they will also garner the system level change to meet goal 17 around partnerships for the goals. 
We know that Australia has been a nation of innovators in the past, and I'm sure that we have the skills to do that now. When you think about what things we've done in Australia, from introduce, the first country to introduce a prepaid postal system, to inventing refrigeration for brewing and meat packing, delivering the anthrax vaccine, the black box, IVF, and also a range of other really inventive health and um, health and broader commercial products that have really strengthened and improved the health and well-being of everyone. So for now, we need to think about what else would be possible and how we can connect business with academia and other areas of the economy to ensure that we can have sustainable change. The responsibility of solving the world's problems cannot be left to one sector or one industry alone. All sectors, including the private sector, multilaterals, academia, and consumers need to join together. And we know this doesn't come without its challenges. We know that each sector and each business and each organization faces their own competing strategic priorities and that that can up enkinder the uptake of innovative technologies. Demonstrating the medium to long-term impact of partnerships will be one of the key ways to bring these partnerships into success. Nonetheless, we do know that collaboration and partnerships will lead to change. There's no more time for incremental improvements for the SDGs. We need to rethink and reimagine what we want the world to be and ensure that we're applying the lens of the SDGs to everything that we do. The impetus for action is significant. We are setting a new era for responsible business, one that is founded on working collaboratively and in partnership to shift our planet onto a more sustainable and resilient path. Thank you. Thank you, Kylie, for opening the session and also sharing with us a, a broad uh, sweep of uh, the SDG and setting the tone for the rest of the panel session today. Thanks again. Um, then our next panel member joins us from El Salvador. Um, and uh, thanks to her for um, staying up uh, late in the office to join us today. Um, and she is uh, Claudia Omedo. Uh, she's the head of exploration at the Acceleration Lab of uh, the United Nations Development Program. Thank you, Lionel. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here with you sharing our work and how we are accelerating our pathway towards the SDG uh, agenda for 2030. Uh, well, as, as, uh, as Lionel said before, I'm Claudio Almedo. I'm head of exploration at the Accelerator Lab in El Salvador. Uh, our work is focused mainly on accelerating sustainable development in El Salvador within a network of 93 laboratories around the world. Um, as I said before, we have a network of 93 accelerator labs embedded in 93 country teams across all regions. And that gives us a broad uh, space to share knowledge, to share experiences, and to apply our net disruptive methodology to accelerate a sustainable development. What do we bring to the development sector? Uh, the 93 UNDP accelerator lab teams uh, we accelerate learning, creating actionable intelligence and testing solutions. We do that within a framework based in three simple actions that would be sense, explore, and grow. The sense stage will be mapping signals, uh, working with uh, future forecasting, and also aiming and, 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 and enriching our process uh, through collective intelligence. Uh, understanding the deep roots of development challenges around the world. With that, we aim to create actionable intelligence and test solutions that strengthen capabilities of supporting and, this, and support decision makers to explore, experiment, and grow portfolios. Uh, what we, our main goal is to adapt to change, expanding the way the organization invests, thinks, and, and and also acts on in the reverse development. And that is important because uh, after the COVID-19 disruption, we've experienced in the whole world. We now know that we need to adapt quickly to changes that are 
uh, massive and that are very disruptive on our current reality. And with that, uh, we are scanning the horizon in building partnerships around the world to keep doing that. Since 2000, 2021, uh, Salvador has been part of this global network of accelerator labs, the United Nations Development Program, uh, as a spearhead of innovation in search for solutions to global challenges. The accelerator lab, uh, it's a bold space to rethink development from a new perspective and to achieve more quickly this agenda on the sustainable development goals. Uh, we have the support of the city of Qatar and the Federal Republic of Germany with German cooperation. And uh, I'd like to, to start the rest of the presentation reflecting on how development challenges are increasingly complex and ever-changing. And in that, in, in that way, our laboratories, uh, led by creative minds uh, and different, uh, integrate different sectors uh, to participate in this collective uh, action towards uh, the SDGs. In general, the labs work around, uh, across the SDGs, uh, concentrating in cities, employment, and responsible consumption and production. And here you can see how uh, our work is spread through the uh, 17 SDGs. Um, but one thing that is important to understand is that whether you focus on one SDG, uh, they're all interconnected. They are all dimensions of our current reality. And, and each of them impacts one another. In El Salvador, uh, and uh, you can see these green dots, we are working in gender equality, clean water and sanitation, decent work and economic growth, reduce inequalities, and uh, working for partnerships for the goals. And uh, I'm going to share a little bit on how we're doing this. Uh, the UNDP Acceleration Laboratory in El Salvador, as part of this learning network of 92 laboratories, is working hand in hand with the various sectors of Salvadoran society to promote innovative solutions to the country's most important challenges. And we are working with private sector, academia, international corporations, civil society, and of course, our main partner, the government of El Salvador, among all other relevant development actors. Uh, we work in close alliance with the innovation at uh, the presidencies, uh, presidencies in uh, innovation secretariat in uh, first in in developing a digital transformation strategy for the public sector. With what with that we want to bring better and inclusive public services to our to to the to, to the to Salvadorians. And that way we are contributing to reduce inequalities and also to de deliver services that are inclusive in terms of gender. Um, we're doing that through uh, a digital readiness assessment index, uh, digital readiness innovation index uh, analysis and working with 34 uh, public sector uh, institutions into to deliver uh, uh, a strategy of space in better infrastructure, uh, in better regulations, uh, better. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm thinking in, in Spanish the whole day. So, uh, uh, better uh, a better business uh, environment. For the for the economic development and also not leaving no one behind and inclusion and being aware of all the intersectionalities uh, that are uh, comprised in, in in development challenges is really important in that sense. In the same logic to bring in the acceleration methodology to different sectors of the population, our lab. It's uh, working with academia into in the business schools to transfer our methodology to build businesses that uh, have a sustainability strategy uh, immersed within their own infrastructure. Uh, the UNDP Accelerator Laboratory also works hand in hand with the Ministry of Innovation, the Ministry of Tourism, the Salvador Institute of Tourism, 
the Salvadorian Institute of Teacher Welfare, and the Ministry of Environment and Natural Resources. This is um, some of our, uh, our current actions. Uh, the Accelerator Lab works in close alliance with the, as I said before, the Presidency Secretary of Innovation. Uh, we are strengthening this and renewing these strategic alliances uh, within the government of Salvador, but also integrating the private sector with our digital and financial inclusion uh, project. Uh, we, pr we promote non-traditional alliances with the relevant players in Salvador technology and, and innovation ecosystem in our water and water quality and livelihoods portfolio. And also promote readiness for innovation uh, through our digital transformation of the public sector strategy. And this is uh, the uh, this is the work of the labs right now. And this is our particular approach to the SDGs. In our water quality and livelihoods uh, portfolio, our accelerator lab is focused in learning its first learning cycle in water and its interrelation with the livelihoods of the country's coastal communities. Uh, this approach is carried out from the human development paradigm that marks that we are in the era of the Anthropocene, which human beings are increasingly influencing the state of the environment. And uh, water is one of the main concerns in, in our country. Uh, it, there is a, a interesting situation where we have a lot uh, of water during the rainy season, but we are in a hydro crisis as well. And most of the population don't have, doesn't have access to, to uh, sanitation systems or drinking water systems. So uh, this is the first, uh, uh, this is the first challenge that we encountered. And what we learned from this is that uh, water is a multidimensional problem that has to do with uh, governance in strong, in strong transparent institutions. It has to do with economic development since uh, the lack of infrastructure and water system uh, prevents population from investing uh, in other areas of their livelihoods uh, uh, for example, education or health, uh, because they spend most of the income in drinking bottled water. There's also uh, the responsible consumption since a lot of the plastic uh, that is consumed in the area goes to our beaches. So as you see, um, in, in, um, within our learning portfolio, um, we see the SDGs as integrated uh, ap approaches and perspectives uh, for, for work. And another of our projects is uh, the Chiquitis, a digital basket to accelerate the recovery from the crisis of micro entrepreneurs. Here we are working uh, with mostly female entrepreneurs that uh, have been hit hard by the pandemic. Uh, they own uh, tourism related businesses, small businesses, for example, they say they, they sell typical food, they sell fruits or small, really, really uh, small businesses uh, that uh, because of the digital divide couldn't recover as swiftly as other sectors. Um, so here we're working uh, with SDG5, uh, building capacities in, in female entrepreneurs but also working with their partners uh, in, in uh, the conception that uh, female entrepreneurs also need to be supported by their partners in their economic de development and leadership. So um, this, this, would be, this would be a, a quick uh, review of our work uh, 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 regarding the SDGs at the Accelerator Lab in El Salvador, and I hope uh, well, it has been of interest to you. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you. I think it's uh, wonderful for um, the audience to actually get a snapshot of um, what you're doing in uh, El Salvador, uh, just in case um, our participants are unfamiliar. Uh, El Salvador is actually in Central America and not in South America. Um, and um, I think it's, it's um, 
actually rare to have um, information, well, at least for an Australian conference, uh, to have uh, information and for insight that's outside of Australia. So, you know, thank you very much for providing uh, the rare insight um, and giving us all a snapshot of what's happening in your space uh, and in your part of the world, um, and adding to the flavor of this uh, panel session as well. So uh, we'll move on to um, our next panel member, um, Michael. Um, and uh, Michael joins us from Melbourne, Victoria. Uh, he's the president of the United Nations Youth uh, Victoria. And uh, UN Youth Australia is a not-for-profit uh, run entirely by people under the age of 25. And that aims to help students across Australia learn about the work of the UN and the key challenges faced um, by the international community. Michael. Perfect. Um, thank you for having me here. Um, before I start, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm calling in from the unceded lands of the Boonwurrung people of the Kulin Nation um, and reaffirm UN Youth Australia's commitment to reconciliation and original justice. So as Lionel mentioned, um, I'm currently the president of UN Youth Victoria and UN Youth is Australia's largest youth-led not-for-profit and it's largely focused around education and the SDGs are really central to everything that we do in UN Youth. They're often our direct function. So for example, running conferences or summits with students discussing issues like international public health or climate change. And there the SDGs are a really helpful framework that we use to under help young people understand the unified nature of these issues as a couple of panelists have already touched on. So for example, while issues like climate action are things that many young people are aware about, sometimes they won't have considered the gendered impacts of climate change and the SDGs are such an important framework for helping these young people to kind of grapple with the way that these issues needed to be responded to together. It also, while some of them have more obvious international components, a lot of young people when they're discussing things like education or gender inequality, don't consider these things in an international context. And the SDGs, again, help us to understand how these things can be addressed internationally. Our particular focus at UN Youth is encouraging young people to think critically about these issues and look for solutions and compromises. Because like these are usually things that young people have heard of before, but they're often just posed with the enormity of these issues. They seem intractable and like they cannot be solved. And that contributes to a general apathy towards taking action on a lot of these issues if it seems like they can't be fixed. So we ask young people from quite a young age to think about what they could do about these issues or what other actors could do. For example, in our voice competition, students as young as 11 or 12 years old are asked to pitch solutions to issues that are often SDG related. This year, we had some young children explaining what they thought could be done to improve Australia's healthcare system in the way that it engages with disabled young people. We had others in a more international context looking at how we can take better climate action in the Asia Pacific and what support they think the countries might need in order to take, like, move towards more renewable technologies. Even when we're not directly discussing things like the SDGs, they become relevant to our work. Our model UN competitions are quite focused on things like security issues, but it's always important for the students to bring in concerns about lack of resources or lack of adequate healthcare systems and explain how this complicates and compounds on any issues that are facing the international community. And so at that point, everything that we do and any issue that the students that engage with us care about can be linked back into this central framework of the SDGs. However, our particular priority is making sure it's never just a one-way direct education where we tell young people what they need to think and what they need to do because they are always able to bring their own experiences and knowledge in order to improve the work of the SDGs and use the SDGs just as a guiding framework rather than something that limits them. For example, we work with a really wonderful organisation called BBM which largely works with young people who are engaged in agricultural industries and are looking to go into that as their career. And people from UN Youth broadly don't have this agricultural background, whereas these young people that we're working with have such expertise about what could be done there. So when we discuss the SDGs with them, it's more as a way to guide the things that they already know about and the things that they already care about and explain how that can interact with these international contexts. So it's never about just dictating to young people and telling them that they need to meet these goals in certain ways. It's explaining how the work that they can do links into things and helping them partner with other organisations that could work that way. Another key aspect of UN Youth is our youth representative program. It hasn't run in its full form for a couple of years due to issues with border closures, but in our last report with 2019, 
we consulted over 7,000 young people in over 200 consultations with one youth representative traveling around. And they engage with incarcerated Indigenous youth in the Northern Territory, with disabled young people around the country and in a bunch of schools to get what they think is quite an accurate snapshot of the issues that young people care about. And then they report back on this in a speech to the United Nations General Assembly in New York. The issues that young people identified or we're, we don't guide them in talk about the SDGs because it's important to us that we're not priming young people to care about certain issues just because they're things that lots of people involved in UN youth as volunteers care about. But the issues that they naturally bring up can usually be linked back to an SDG framework, looking at things like quality of education, like gender inequality, like racism, discrimination, and like climate change. Uh, despite these being the issues that young people identify as most important to them, knowledge of the SDGs themselves is quite low amongst Australian young people. Some of the students we engage with will have heard about it in a class, but a lot of them it will be entirely new to them and none of them seem to have a particularly deep knowledge because the SDGs haven't really broken through into things like our education system. And so while they can speak in an incredibly articulate manner on specific issues related to the SDGs that they care about, that kind of unifying context isn't something that they have much exposure to. And that's why at UN Youth, we think that the SDGs are such an important thing to work with young people about in order to unify their like, diverse concerns. And realistically, one of the reasons why some young people, even who have heard of the SDGs, might not really care about them that much is a general scepticism towards international agreements. There's a real rhetoric amongst a lot of Australian young people that these can't do anything, or maybe because young people are obviously politically diverse on some sides of politics, there is an idea that maybe Australia shouldn't be bound by these agreements and that it's inappropriate. But both sides of that lead to a general scepticism and unwillingness to prioritise things like the SDGs and see why they're so important. That being said, more and more we're finding that young people are aware that these issues, whether or not, whatever response they want to take to them, can't be looked at without considering the global context. And that's why I think that the SDGs are such an important thing to integrate into young people's lives, because no matter what they are advocating for and what they want to do, um, we think that the SDGs provide a good overarching framework that explains what is being done and where we're going. And it means that these issues are no longer isolated concerns, but something that we can all kind of work towards um, in order to reach whatever future young people want for themselves. So yeah, um, that is about it for me. Thanks so much for sharing with us, Michael. Um, I think it's great that within this panel, we have um, not just diversity of views uh, in terms of you know, the, the markets uh, or locations, but also in terms of the demographics you know, with uh, Michael sharing with us views that come from a, uh, a, the younger generation, which uh, I think in many of the conferences um, are missing. Um, and it's great that our UN um, panel here uh, actually is able to cover some of those uh, views um, and uh, particularly from uh, Australia. Belissa Rojas joins us from Washington DC. She is an impact management advisor at SDG Impact. SDG Impact is a United Nations Development Program flagship initiative working to accelerate private sector contributions to the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. It's my pleasure to welcome Belissa to share with us her insights on the state of sustainable development goals. Melissa. Thank you, Lionel. I'm very happy to be here today and really honored to, to be part of this amazing panel. So today I'm gonna be talking about the SDGs, of course, and let you know a little bit from our perspective at UNDP, how well or not we're doing uh, in terms of progressing towards the achievement of the SDGs. Today, I'm going to talk to you about uh, the path towards the Sustainable Development Goals. To start, I would like to talk first about what is sustainability. And I'm going to borrow the definition of the UN World Commission on Environment and Development. Sustainable development is the development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. In other words, it's about not compromising the future just to meet you know, the economic, environmental, and social needs of the present. The Sustainable Development Goals are the world's blueprint to achieve a better and more sustainable future for all. And not only that, but they also present an important uh, 
business opportunity for the private sector. It has been estimated, for example, that achieving gender equality alone could increase the size of the global economy by 26%. Likewise, uh, 12 trillion annual businesses opportunities could be unlocked if the SDGs were pursued in just four major sectors, food, agriculture, cities, energy, and materials and health and well-being. So really the SDGs uh, provide an opportunity for all of us to have a prosperous and sustainable future that meets the needs of people and the planet. However, uh, despite having this North Star that the SDGs have provided, we are not yet on a sustainable path. And basically what got us here won't get us there. There being a, a prosperous and sustainable uh, economic development. Uh, in my country of origin, we say that um, an image can, can be worth more than many, many words thousands of words. And uh, I wanna share with you some images of what is, are the type of challenges we're facing today as humanity. I invite you to observe and bear with me when I show you some pictures. After this uh, roadshow of pictures that are not fiction, but the reality we're facing, I have some questions to share with us all and uh, for us to reflect. Is this the word we want? Do we really think this won't have consequences for the way we live, our jobs, our businesses, investments, and also uh, the future generation? As mentioned earlier, we're not yet on a sustainable path to achieve a prosperous and sustainable future. We are not on track to achieve this SD the SDGs at the current rate uh, of progress. And even before COVID, uh, the estimation was that we would achieve the SDGs not by 2030, but 52 years later by 2082. Another important um, consideration is that um, many of the current negative impacts that uh, we're having, you know, by doing business, investing, or just the way we live on uh, people and the planet could be avoided or significantly reduced. Another issue is that uh, global finance capital flows are not really being channeled towards those most in need. And more and more environmental and social considerations are affecting and becoming a constraint for uh, economic growth. And although there is a lot of interest in sustainability, there's also a lot of SDG washing, meaning that interest for alignment to the SDGs is not necessarily being translated into actual impacts. In today's global economy, capital markets play a critical role um, they really define and provide incentives on how capital is allocated. And therefore, they can also have uh, the keys uh, for us to get out of, of the mess we got in, in terms of the climate crisis we're facing and social inequality. However, the economic system has evolved uh, in a way that maximizes uh, financial value out of finite resources. And of course, that model has an expiration date. And that expiration date is uh, becoming uh, closer and closer. Why is this happening? So basically there are uh, negative externalities that are not uh, priced into the system. So in other words, today, uh, organizations are not fully aware of their negative economic, environmental and social impacts. And anyway, there's no way to price that in, in, in the price that we pay for goods and services or taxes or other. Although there is interest in sustainability, as I said earlier, um, there is a, a strong trend and way of thinking that views sustainability as a way of managing environmental, social and governance risks that affect the value of the enterprise, the financial value. 
So that lens um, systematically underestimates, you know, future financial risk because negative impacts today on the environment and on society can really have a negative effect for future generations. There is a lot of information out there, but the data we collect is not related or focused on impacts, especially negative ones. So therefore they are not useful for decision-making in a way of ensuring that organizations and the private sector is not only profitable, but also sustainable. And above all, not impacting negatively uh, the environment and society. Another issue that we face is that there's increased speculation in uh, financial markets. So that creates a lot of instability in the system. So these are just few considerations and I will share this presentation with you so you can come back to, the, to, the, to this uh, information. The consequences of our economic system uh, are unevenly distributed. In other words, uh, those that are creating most negative impact are not those that are the most affected by climate change and inequality, as this picture illustrates very well. This is another example uh, to make this point. So if we look at the projections and the effects of uh, global warming into different regions, you can observe that any increase um, above uh, two degrees Celsius uh, affects in more uh, proportion uh, the less developed countries around the world. So what can we do about it? How can we get ourselves in a sustainable path? So to achieve the SDGs, um, we believe at SDG Impact uh, that we need to transform and shift our mindset and the way we make decisions. I will pause for a second to introduce you to SDG Impact. So SDG Impact is a United Nations Development Program initiative that was born in 2019 to do two main things. First, mobilize more capital towards sustainable development and the SDGs. And two, increase the effectiveness of such capital in order to deliver actual impact. We more and more are working towards not only doing that, but also shifting and changing the mindset of how private sector operates in general, because it's not gonna be useful if we close the gap with the SDGs just to get another type of problems to solve. Otherwise it's a continuous problem. So in order to, to mobilize more capital toward the SDGs and also increase the effectiveness, we have developed two main products. One are the SDG investor maps, so the SDG investor maps help investors to focus uh, on uh, areas that generate both financial return and impact at the country level. So I like to summarize that by a simple question, are we doing the right things? So are we allocating our capital where it's most impactful? That's what the SDG investor maps help you address. And then we have the SDG impact standards, which are all about how we make decisions, how we manage our organizations in a way that maximizes the likelihood of having a positive impact on people and the planet. The SDG impact standards are really aligned to this message of changing mindsets because they place impact management and sustainability at the core of the organization. In other words, this is really going beyond about corporate social responsibility or sustainable reporting, because it goes to the core of management decisions. It also uh, takes you into a journey that moves from SDG alignment into action. For example, SDG alignment can happen if you align what you already do to the SDGs, but that doesn't mean that you're taking a conscious and proactive action to choose those actions that really will have um, more impact into the SDGs. We also move for reporting towards the decision-making. In the same line just mentioned, uh, reporting can be report what we already do, but decision-making is about constantly taking decisions to maximize impact. We also move from measurement to management because measurement um, generates data that if it's not fed back into a loop for continuous improvement, it's not gonna improve decision-making. 
by placing sustainability at the core, it also became strategic since there are opportunities related to the SDGs in terms of generating businesses and profit. It also goes beyond financial risk management. In other words, we don't focus only on environmental, social, and government risks that affect the value, the financial value of the enterprise or of our investments, but also that have an impact on sustainability per se on people and the planet. And this moved the organization from an egocentric view to a systems view, where the organization, as it impacts, the people and the planet, it's also impacted by what happens in the environment and society. So we really believe that putting sustainability at the core of business and decision-making is gonna really uh, help us addressing uh, the current crisis as humanity faces. And the SDG impact standard help you on that journey. And the standards are really useful because if you are committed to impact, they really help you to make sure that you don't forget anything that would increase their chances uh, to get to that impact. They are based on best practices and part of, of the journey is to uh, apply the standards and then get assured and get an SDG impact seal. Why a seal? Because we believe that it's important to provide the right incentives and signaling to the market to reward those organizations that are really committed and managed to deliver impact. The SDG impact standards are related to many principles, standards, tools, and practices. Uh, and they really consider all the latest in relation to sustainability, ESG, and impact measurement and management. But as you see, they are placed in the middle between high-level principles and specific tools because they really focus on the how to, how to manage, again, to achieve those impacts and SDG goals. The SDG impacts are built uh, based on four pillars, uh, strategy, management, transparency, and governance. And they are a tool for decision-making. If you access our website, you will see that we have four sets of standards for enterprises, for private equity funds, for bond issuers and also for uh, DFIs uh, organizations. All of this is available in our website. Uh, the latter I mentioned, we did it in partnership with OECD, uh, the standards for, for DFIs and development finance. And we have also a glossary of terms. We have uh, self-assessment tools that help you to start the journey to uh, implement the standards, which is really the journey to incorporate impact into the way your organization make decisions. And we have also uh, developed in partnership with uh, Case University, uh, a course that is available for free in Coursera about uh, IMM for the SDGs that we're very happy to share with you and invite you to attend. So in other words, we're fully committed in supporting um, the private sector and everyone interested in sustainability and really uh, drive the movement to change mindsets. So we really find a new normal, a new normal well where business and investments uh, are defined by having impact and sustainability at the core in the way they operate in their day-to-day -day and in their decision-making. Thank you. Okay, so um, we're gonna move on into questions and answers for, uh, sorry, with our uh, panel members. Um, and uh, we'll be organizing questions uh, on a panel member by panel member basis, uh, starting with uh, Kylie. Um, and um, if we have questions for Kylie, um, could you please uh, feel free to ask right now? Hi, Kylie. Um, out of the 17 goals, are there, any that are more relevant to businesses today, given our global context? I don't know if so much in a global context, but I think one of the big challenges that business ends up facing with the SDGs is that they can be a bit um, overwhelming in part. So a lot of businesses, there's a, there's a misguided notion that all businesses have to demonstrate how they're going to contribute to all 17 goals. 
when actually we say that's not the case, that they're better to look at the company's strategy, where the company operates, how the company operates, what their overall vision is, and then to map the SDGs according to that um, strategic outcome that they want to achieve. So for the UN Global Compact, we advocate using what's called the Compass. Um, it's a tool that was developed shortly after the SDGs were launched, but it's still very relevant in terms of helping business get through and cut through some of that confusion of the SDGs and then make their way through to defining which of the SDGs is most relevant to them. The other thing that business has to be more and more conscious of is, or cognizant, I should say, of, is that sometimes when you pull a positive lever on one SDG, it can create a negative impact on another SDG. So a really good example of that might be a renewable energy company that's invested in solar panels or wind turbines in, let's say, South America, Southern America. And in doing so, they've obviously contributed quite strongly to affordable energy, a clean and affordable energy, and also climate change and, and goal 13. But what they might have done is contributed very negatively to life on land. And they might have also done it in a way that has affected the, the traditional landholders of that land. And so there might be issues around pre, prior and informed consent. There might be issues around um, those landholders being forced off their land or not having as strong agricultural production. So businesses need to be very cognizant of that. In Australia, um, and in fact, globally, SDG 13 for us is absolutely the most imperative. You know, If we don't have very swift action on climate change, the impact that it can have on across all of those SDGs is, is very, very significant. Um, in terms of the UN Global Compact, we have what we call five lead and shape SDGs. So those SDGs are SDG five on gender equality, SDG nine on um, decent work and economic growth. For us here in Australia, that's ensuring that we have a really strong focus on um, working with our businesses to make sure that they're, they're aware of the risks of modern slavery and that they're putting in processes in place to reduce um, any impacts of modern slavery and human trafficking. Um, SDG 13, as we've mentioned on climate action, SDG 16 on peace, justice and strong institutions. So from a business perspective, this is really about ensuring that they have good solid processes in place to reduce any impacts or, or actually reduce the, the likelihood of bribery and corruption occurring within their business or their supply chain. And then SDG 17, which I talked about quite regularly in my speech, and that's that need for collaboration within business sectors, but also more broadly. Thank you. Thanks, Claudia. Thanks, Kylie. Uh, I have a question from, um, an audience, um, and the question is, uh, what is the role of business uh, or businesses in achieving the SDGs? Yeah, so my speech covered off a bit of that already in terms of what businesses need to do and why it's so responsible, why it's such a big responsibility of businesses. I think, however, what we need to be really aware of from, from a business perspective is that Businesses, and many of them are well-known household brands or they're global brands, they're multinational corporations. Some of these businesses have bigger, G bigger revenue and profit than the GDPs of some countries globally. And so it's really, from a business perspective, the role is making sure that they're directing capital to the best place possible for a, an, an equitable and better future. And I think what it also demonstrates is that businesses are interconnected and they need to be open enough to sharing the challenges, the global challenges with other businesses and with government and with civil society and other non-business actors to ensure that they're all working in alignment with the SDGs. So businesses have the responsibility now more than ever, and this is regardless of their size. They might be a small micro organization or sole trader all the way up to a very large publicly listed company, but they have the responsibility to take action and deliver against the global goals. And that's to ensure that the sustainability of our society, our economies and our planet is actually saved. And in doing so, this actually builds resilience within economies, it builds local job security, it builds local export abilities. So if you take climate change as an example, there's no one, no company out there these days or very few that would deny that climate change isn't a business risk. 
And the consequences of climate change globally are obviously far reaching. And it's, it's not just the heat waves and the floods um, that we hear about, but it's also infectious diseases and pandemics. It's the severity and the catastrophic outcomes that come with a lot of these weather events and um, a lot of the zoonotic diseases that have shown to have an influence and um, a direct connection. So really from a business perspective, businesses need to understand where they sit in that whole entire world of challenges. They need to think about what are the things that they have the ability to pull the levers on because of the area of focus for that business or because of the size of their, their capital and then allocate a lot of that capital to innovative solutions in that, in that area. So that's, that's ensuring things like what we talked about around goal seven and um, reliable energy, affordable energy, but making sure that you're doing that equitably. And I think, you know, given the scale that businesses have, the number of employees they have, that, that really is their role. And if it's in within countries where government policy or government legislation in this space is lacking, they need to really step above the parapet and, and make sure that they're demonstrating what change can actually deliver. Thanks so much for sharing, Kylie. We'll now take questions for Claudia. Hi, Claudia. Um, thanks for your presentation. Um, so it seems that one of the key focuses of the Accelerator Labs are testing solutions and presenting evidence about how they work. How do you think that this more evidence-based approach will help to overcome some of the barriers that make some governments reluctant to work towards sustainable development? Um, it's a very good question. Um, actually, uh, the, the aim of the Accelerator Labs is to work with governments in finding and testing the solutions together so that evidence, uh, we do not present evidence to them, but make them part of the process. And the participatory approach, which uh, that's why our, our methodology is based in these three broad uh, steps, you might say, sense, explore, grow, you know, uh, map solutions. And, and, and one of the, the strategies to uh, better translate this information to governments in order for them to make better and more inclusive and, and, and more informed decisions is to make them part of the process since the beginning. So uh, one the champions that we have in government, for example, in our case, the Innovation Secretariat, um, the, the the working together in a participatory manner uh, from the start with signal mapping, with the future forecasting, uh, allows us to walk with them into these, with our partners, strategic partners, uh, to these processes. And so that way, um, what, what we do is that we plant a seed that then is able to grow within government. This experimental approach. I gather that it's not uh, easy to implement in a culture that, or, or, in, or in, in structures that are very bureaucratic and, and vertical in terms of decision-making. But uh, we have had a great experience. I can only speak from my, our experience in El Salvador, but it's been a great experience to work in a, at a technical level with government uh, office officers. And then uh, that what happens is we call we call bottom up innovation. We do something that works well, yeah, and this experimental approach or, or testing something that might or not might work, but in a small scale but that produces results and learnings that are actionable. Actually, that's the way to make it uh, to make it move up, and that's been our experience so far. And for example, I'm just going to put this, this, this little example. Um, one of the reasons why, uh, that prevented a lot of the population, especially uh, female micro entrepreneurs from recovering from the COVID-19 crisis and economic crisis uh, has been the digital divide. You know, um, 
it's the ratio of in technology usage is like four to one uh, between men and women, and that really puts a barrier to 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 this uh, to the recovery um, businesses. Um, so we started working with two uh, institutions, two small institutions, in on on a digital this digital basket solution, but uh, and started to do this digital readiness assessment and. As they as our partners, so it, it it worked and it it had it was producing results. Uh, now it has become a, a countrywide initiative uh, that's going to uh, and we're going to work from institutions from health to uh, safety to energy, uh, women's rights. So um, I think that that's how. Uh, our methodology, uh, it's able to bring innovation from the bottom up uh, to leadership, government leadership. Perfect, thank you. Gracias, Claudia. De nada. So um, we have a question from the audience for you, Claudia. Um, and the question is, there are numerous frameworks and goals that the businesses often use to guide their strategy and policy. Uh, why should businesses choose um, the SDGs? I think uh, businesses should uh, choose the SDG framework because it talks about the future. It's a matter of sustaining a business through the uh, through time, and um, businesses. Uh, it's not a matter of responsibility, but also in, in their self-interest. These frameworks allows, us to, allows businesses to think on how building a better world is also building a better business environment for them. And in El Salvador, in, in our context, for example, I, I usually, uh, when, when we are approached by businesses, and this is something really nice uh, that has happened in the last year, uh, big industries that are great stakeholders in the water and in, in water quality or, or uh, uh, responsible consumption or waste management. Uh, even a plastics company came to us and, and to learn and, and, and told us, we know you're working around water and around community livelihoods. What have you learned that can help us, you know, uh, deal with this uh, growing problem that we are a part of and being held as stakeholders. Uh, so that's, uh, for me, we, we have uh, started, to, we are doing it right, right? We are uh, planting that seed of what if I invest in better quality, water quality? What if I invest in, in my own, um, value chain in order to reduce impact, how is that going to benefit uh, my company, not now, but in the future, how is going to build a relationship with my future customers? I think uh, companies are starting to be aware that uh, uh, people demand companies to take care of, business to take care of them. And that also means taking care of the world we live in, the, co the communities and, 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 yeah, contributing in, in, in a participatory way. So I think every business that would like to see itself in the market in the next 50 years should be addressing uh, the sustainable development goals as a framework to monitor their performance also. And well, um, I think uh, the benefit companies are, are, are doing that. That's something that's growing. Uh, in Salvador, that's a concept that's been growing too. And startups, I also thinking about that. And not just building a, bu a business, but building a business that creates benefits. So um, that would be my answer to that. Thanks again for sharing, Claudia. So we'll be um, taking questions for um, Michael. Michael, what uh, effect has the global pandemic had on Australian youth's efforts 
to meet the SDGs by 2030? Um, I think it's had a bit of a mixed effect, to be honest. Um, so obviously, one of the ways that some young people choose to work towards certain SDG targets is by engaging in activism and protest. Um, and that's obviously been complicated by stay-at-home orders and a very infectious disease. That's not to say that there haven't been some incredibly um, important and powerful um, movements over the last year. I think that Black Lives Matter particularly pops to mind. Um, and in general, there have been some things there. Um, but it has been complicated. I think it's also important to acknowledge that lots of young people and lots of people in general, but young people often work in industries that have been particularly affected um, by the pandemic and are in particularly financially insecure situations. And it's quite hard to prioritise something like a long term development target um, when you're thinking about where you're going to get your next meal from um, or any of those kinds of things. So I think that it certainly has posed some real challenges to young people fighting um, for the SDGs. But at the same time, I do also think that it has placed a real spotlight that's made it hard to ignore some of the issues that young people have been pushing for for a very long time that are related to the SDGs. But obviously, good health and well-being, making sure that everyone has access to adequate health care um, is quite important um, during a pandemic and something that kind of all sides of politics have needed to acknowledge um, is an issue. And similarly, as mentioned earlier, things like climate action, do come into a new light when we start to see um, an emerging pandemic that really shuts down every bit of business and every bit of life and kills a lot of people. And that creates just an extra sense of urgency to understand that these effects aren't just long-term things that will only affect young people, but are kinds of issues that are affecting people now. Similarly, things like gender equality that might not be directly related to the pandemic have come more into light by looking at things like the increased rates of domestic violence, maybe when people aren't able to leave their homes as easily, but also looking at the ways that expectations around women in care work. Um, and that is particularly true for a lot of young women who are expected to sacrifice lots of the stability that lots of other people have been able to access during the pandemic. Finally, and I think most importantly, um, we can have a discussion around quality education. Because that is the issue that in our 20, 2019 Youth Rep Tour that young people identified as their top priority in the SDG that they cared about the most. And I think it's become very clear um, the ways that educational inequality work during the pandemic. You'll see some schools that have been able to transition online relatively easily. Students consistently have access to good internet connections. They have internal intranets that mean that while learning is still absolutely disrupted and it's still been very hard for those students, they haven't been like really denied significant amounts of education. On the flip side, particularly throughout 2020, we saw lots of schools that couldn't do these things, that students who weren't getting consistent lessons via platforms like Zoom, things going around with like worksheets and expectations being placed on parents who are often working themselves or were out of work and in really difficult situations to do things like that. So I think the quality education and making sure like adequate resourcing comes through is definitely something that has been put light by the pandemic. Finally, it's difficult to see what kind of tangible impacts this has had yet, but just given that everyone has been forced online by the pandemic, I think it's probably been easier for people um, to cooperate and deal with like international people, young people who share similar priorities. Um, and given that the SDGs are global issues, I think that it can never hurt to be able to have more connections with people with different perspectives and different experiences that could be applied within an Australian context. Thanks, Michael, for that insight. Um, we have a question from the audience uh, who would like to know, um, from your point of view, what can we do to make young people care more about the SDGs? Cool. So the good news is that I think that young people already care about a lot of the specific goals within the SDGs. For example, our last Youth Rep report found that the top five issues were education, the environment and climate change, mental health, racism and discrimination, and domestic violence. And some of those are obviously directly SDGs, something like quality education, and some of them have very clear links to things like gender equality, um, which means that the SDGs are issues that people care about, or at least some of the SDGs are quite relevant. But both the challenging and exciting thing about the SDGs is that it does force you to unify these priorities in a way that lots of young people don't. So even if they care about all of these issues in isolation, they maybe don't care about the overarching framework. I think that there are broadly two things that we can do um, in order to make young people care about it more. The first one is just based on increasing awareness, because as I mentioned earlier, there are just a lot of young people that we engage with who have never or only very vaguely heard of the SDGs as a framework. What I would love to see is the sustainable development goals being made across curriculum priority in the Australian curriculum. 
Um, what that means is that it is an expectation that the understanding about discussion of the SDGs get implemented into every learning area. And I think that they are something that could be really relevant there. There is currently a cross-curricular priority of sustainability, which I think is great, but that's sustainability solely within a kind of environmental understanding of it. And I think that that doesn't really capture the full scope that the SDGs do, and it would be good to see a way um, to get that other form of integration into it. And while a cross-curriculum priority wasn't specifically something that young people that we talked to requested, there is a consistent demand that was seen youth rep report after youth rep report, which is that Australian young people want their curriculum to be more relevant to the kinds of issues that they care about. And though, given that those issues are related to the SDGs, I think that this is something that there would be a lot of demand for. But secondly, I also think it's important to make it clear the SDGs are tangible. And that's why it's been really exciting in this panel, hearing about things like the Accelerator Labs, hearing about the ways that businesses um, can implement these goals to make tangible solutions. Because I think it is very hard to convince young people that they need to be on board with something if it just seems like a target that will not be met, that's one of many targets and kind of these abstract set of goals instead of goals that are guiding and fostering this innovation and new solutions. And that's particularly true as young people get a little bit older. So for example, we find that the youngest students that we engage in something like our voice competitions aren't too cynical towards the world. They have a lot of faith in the UN and the solutions that they're pitching are these really bold strategies for new like UN bodies or new sets of rules that countries will just follow because surely everyone wants to do the right thing. But by the time we're getting to students who are getting closer to graduating high school um, or students who have been particularly disadvantaged and failed by systems as a whole, there's a lot more cynicism there. And I think that that's fair and reasonable for that cynicism to exist. So if we want young people to care about the SDGs, I think we need to make the SDGs something that's worth caring about and something that is actually going to bring about these changes, um, which is why it's really great to hear about all of the different things that people are doing um, in order to make these goals actually something that will tangibly improve the futures of these young people. Thanks again, Michael, for articulating uh, the SDGs and, and the, uh, the views of the youth, uh, especially in uh, Australia. Um, and uh, we'll move on to questions for um, Belissa. Hi, Belissa. Thanks for joining all the way from the US. I would just like to understand what challenges that you've faced working with businesses and investors on ESG impact and measurement, and what approach you've taken to overcome these challenges. This is a great question. Um, so basically, uh, there are three main challenges that I face uh, when uh, working with investors. And the first one is that every time we engage and start talking about impact measurement and management and what to do better to contribute to the SDGs, the main question I get is, what are the metrics I should use? How do I measure? And I'm like, wait, 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 measure what exactly? What is the problem you're trying to solve? Right? So we're very eager to have an impact and show an impact. And sometimes we get there too fast. We get to the metric without really analyzing, but what is the problem we're trying to solve? What's the magnitude of this problem? Who has been affected by this? And then given that and why this problem is happening, what can I do to help? What's the solution? And then measuring success in terms of the problem we define, right? So that's one you know, uh, big challenge uh, you know, that, I, that I get, that I face. And very related to that uh, is reporting, right? To show the world how well we're doing. Uh, but very quickly again, right? We all want to show that we're contributing and, uh, and those are the first two things that investors request, right? Metrics and reporting. And then I go back to that point in terms of why I think this is a challenge. Uh, the second is um, ESG and impact and sustainability. Like, what are we talking about, right? It's like everything is all combined right now. Uh, sometimes we uh, use the, the terms uh, like they were synonyms when they're not. And if we're not very clear, you know, on what is it that we're trying to do, then it's really hard to do it well. So that's a second challenge. And the third one is that uh, sometimes you have a counterpart within an organization, an investor or a company that they are the sustainability person or the impact person. But this is not the entire organization. And they really face challenges getting internal buy-in to make the changes needed to, to make the organization most impactful. So these are the three main challenges, right? One, focus on metrics and reporting. Two, uh, ESG, impact, sustainability. What is it that we're doing? And then three, 
how do I get bring others along in this journey towards impact? And what I do is, well, first, take a step back, as I said, when we talk about metrics and reporting. Uh, reporting uh, on sustainability or impact without changing the way we take decisions really doesn't change anything. I can do whatever I've been doing. And, I, and then we talk about alignment, right, to the SDGs. We've been talking about that. And just match it with the SDGs and make it look really nice. But that doesn't mean that the organization fundamental questions to improve that contribution towards the SDGs. It just means that whatever they are doing already, they're showing it to you in terms of the SDGs, in terms of impact, and in terms of metrics. Let's use very nice metrics, so very clear metrics, standardized metrics. So I take a step back and I try to, to, to reason with the organizations. Before picking metrics, we need to understand what is it that you're trying to achieve. Because the metric is just a way of measuring success. But the really important thing is the goal, right? The goal we're trying to measure. So that's, you know, uh, something that I do. And we go back to the theory of change. What's the problem we're trying to solve? Why is this happening? How we can contribute? And how we measure different uh, KPIs or metrics to ensure that we're making progress towards that goal, whatever that goal is. And then the reporting is just going to show that. And, and when we talk about reporting, something that is you know, different about the SDG impact standards is we talk about not only impact and performance, but also management practices. So it's not only about the results today, but it's also about how the organization or the fund is making decisions to optimize that impact over time. Okay, so the standards are really about that. So I try to really, again, talk about the theory of change and then talk about decision-making and how reporting explains that as a whole. And this is really relevant, for example, when you think about exits. Everybody talk about exit. Okay, if you exit this investment, what's the, what's the impact, right? Is the impact in danger? Well, for me, something really important is what is the commitment of this organization of continuing the, the journey without the impact investor? That's what we really wanna know because a prediction of impact has many assumptions, but the commitment, the management, the institution in place to achieve that impact, that's more likely to stay and harder to change, right? And then you will know that they will always try to get better. So that's one thing I do. So I use the standards a lot. The second one, of course, you might guess is talking about definitions. Okay, doesn't matter. And it's a joke, right? As I call it mango, it, I don't care, but let's talk exactly what are we referring to when we say impact. And, and this is really important because right now there's a lot, you know, in, at COP26, there was this big announcement about, you know, some standardization of corporate reporting, you know, new, com new commitments and all that. But when we face the decision of what tool or what standard or what is the right for me, I always ask, but what is it that you want to do? Because depending on you what to do, you can pick the tool, right? So you don't play, you don't take a basketball ball to play soccer, right? It's just exactly the same. So for example, there are some organizations that they seek to protect their enterprises from environmental risks. Right? So they want to protect the revenue, their model. That's one way of including environmental considerations in decision making. Others that are worried about that, but also about the effect they're having on the planet and on people beyond financial considerations. That's the other story. Then there are others that, that are thinking, what can I do to save you know, the planet? I really want to help and move the needle that's a different situation, right? So depending on what your goal is, you will use ESG tools more oriented to financial materiality or others to double materiality. I mean, there, then you can get in the terminology that might be more complex, but the most important question is what is it that you try to achieve? And in this spectrum, where do you see? Because they're not, they're not the same. So this is really, really important. And, and, and we face a challenge that we need to keep each other truthful because we all want to show that we're doing our best to save our planet and, and help humanity. And I believe that, but we're not all doing it in the same way and not always might be as effective. But if at least we know what we're doing, how it's different, then we will learn together and then get better at it. So that's the other thing I do. And the third one for getting buy-in, that's the hardest. So what we do is to motivate and keep giving support to those sustainability officers or impact officers that really face, face challenges to get buy-in from others. So we, we try to build capacity at UNDP to, so they get 
more tools in terms of impact management, but also we're trying, and this is a goal for everyone that wants to use the standard and learn more to work with us, to get case studies out there and to show that there's a value of being more impactful and sustainable. We believe that the world is changing, the demand for sustainability is gonna increase, People will want to work with responsible companies, buy from responsible companies, you know, and invest in responsible companies. So we're getting there even beyond regulation. So what we try to do is being supportive. So, so the organizations get there when they're ready, right? And support those that want to push the, that agenda. So those are the, the things we try to do at SDG. Thank you so much, Belissa. Uh, that was a, a very insightful um, answer to uh, a challenging question. Uh, Belissa, I have a question from the audience as well. Um, and the question is, how do we move from SDG alignment to actual results or impact? That's a great question. Thank you. Um, so earlier, I mentioned that alignment can really be done by matching what we already do with these SDGs, right? That it could be at the indicators level, the target level. And it's like dressing up for a party, right? We don't change anything. We just make us look prettier and then we go and we're ready for the picture. But what we're talking here is really about um, a management question, a strategic question. So action towards the achievement of the SDGs doesn't mean only aligning what we already do or even aligning capital towards the SDGs. It's really about results, right? And it's really about impact. So if we have a world where ESG investing, for example, is growing exponentially, and I think by 2025, it's supposed to be one third of all assets under management, but the results don't increase, you know, in the same proportion is that there's something that we're not doing right. So basically um, to me and to SDG impact, what we're trying to do is going back to the way we take decisions in the way we manage our organizations. So that means in strategy, in our policies, in our processes, in our systems, in the way we track results, in the way we report, in our governance. So for example, if we're talking about strategy, again, imagine that you're a CEO of a company, and then of course you're gonna ask you know, your employees for a quarterly report with a dollar figure, right? What's the sales, you know, the profit, what's the projection of it, what are the risks? So imagine that for this CEO, success is not only dollars anymore, but impact on people and planet. So he's gonna ask that same CEO, he's gonna ask the same things, but with two additional dimensions. So dollar and impact on people and planet. What would be different? Maybe not the management. I, I'm really a believer that instead of, and I, I am an impact management person, right? And specialist in theory, at least. I don't believe that they need to learn more about what Belisa comes with as a technical person. I believe that what they already do, they need to continue doing it with that definition of success. And then they will hire, you know, an impact management specialist to give the reporting or, or to pick a metric. But in the way they will be managing, it's just business as they know how to do it successfully, but with this impact consideration embedded in decision-making. And then as a result, and then let's go back to the CEO when it's dollars. When the sales fall, what do they do? They adjust, they review the marketing strategy, they review their costs, they start moving really fast for what? To get to the target they had in terms of sales, in terms of profit. So imagine the same in terms of impact. So that would take uh, the world, you know, the private sector from alignment not only to action, but to results by doing what they already do well. I'm a real believer in the private sector. I, I think that we're a humanity. We went to the moon and beyond. We found a vaccine in six months. I really believe if the CEOs of the world just you know, change this chip, this mindset that success is also impact, oh, they will be teaching me how to do that impact, how to really achieve it. So that's what I'm hoping uh, that we achieve us you know, together and move from alignment, as I said, to action and then to results. Thanks again, Belissa. So thanks again to the esteemed panel. Um, fantastic to have views from a team of experts um, in various roles across um, the UN uh, agencies uh, with uh, Kylie from uh, Australia and Michael as well uh, from Australia representing um, youth. Uh, views, uh, Claudia 
from El Salvador and Belissa from the US. Uh, thanks for making time out of your busy schedule uh, to join us in this panel session today. And also in closing, I would like to thank uh, Moral Fairground for actually um, putting in the time effort and, and uh, sponsoring this um, panel session um, and, and also its support for the UNHCR. Thank you, Moral Fairground, and thank you, uh, Susanna.